Hi, welcome to the table. My name's Steve Rain. I'm Jonathan Hicks. And I'm Mark Windle. And we're going back again. This time last year, we did my top 30 games of all time. I've done another list with another top 30 of all time. So we're going to run through those. There are a few differences. There are a few games that have shot up and dropped down. Um, but we're going to have a look at, uh, first in this video, numbers 30 to 21. Um, I use that change that uh, software that you might point me out last time. Oh, okay. um, it's uh, the board get oh, that's the name of the website. I <laughs> uh, can't remember, but basically it's sorting. I was going to ask though, did you look at your old list before compiling the new list? So I did my new list separately, I did a whole new list, and then down the side I then put where they were last time in case I missed any out or something. Oh, you looked back. I looked back to make sure that I hadn't missed any out or to make sure well, that's dropped. That's dropped a long way. Maybe yeah, maybe I need to reconsider that or something. Oh, okay. Like that. Yeah. All right. Um, but yeah, otherwise, yeah, similar to last year, I made my top thirty games. It was very hard. Apart from the top, maybe maybe fifteen or ten or so, it was very hard to kind of. Why is twenty two better than twenty three? Well, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I use the sorting out. Basically, you pair things together lots of times, like hundreds of times, and then eventually it says, "Here's your list in this order." And then I moved them around a bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, on we go to uh, my number uh, thirty. Number 30. Uh, so my number 30 was a game that came out last year. Uh, it was a game that was not on my list last year, and that is uh, Sagrada. Sagrada is a oh. dice drafting oh. game where you're trying to fill in your um, stained glass window as such, um, and you get to draft two dice, but in a horseshoe way. Trying to do it around. It's a game that you struggle with, isn't it? Oh my goodness. <laughs> it looks like such a nice family friendly game. Because everything's really colourful. The dice look great, and you have these nice colourful stained glass windows, and you pop the dice in. But it's such a brain burner. So I, I do think it's very good. And I like it. But I've got to be in the right mood to play it. I need to have energy. If I'm feeling a bit tired at the end of the night, I don't want to sit down and play the grass. So it's just too hard. So I quite like it. I, I, mean, I've got, I mean, I don't find it as, as intense as you. Maybe I just... Yeah. I like... I just, it just kind of flows to me. If you ever go wrong, go wrong. But... I'm, I'm with Mark. I like I like the options. I like the the restrictions yeah. and the options you get. And and importantly, in a dice drafting game, trying to work out what can come back to you, that's a skill. Well, that's good for me. No one's, mm. no one's going to take that, so I'll take this one. It's so hard. And keep your options open, basically. Yeah, I love it. It's great. Number twenty nine. Uh, so my number 29 is another new game to the list, and it's a new game uh, because it came out this year. It is Pretty Clever, or Dan Shun Clever. Uh, I think it's Pretty Darn Clever in English, yeah, isn't it? Oh, really? Um, yeah. yeah, it's Pretty Darn Clever, <laughs> ah, okay. uh, which I quite like. I think it's a better name, but basically it is a, um, it's a Yahtzee-style game where you roll some dice, you take something, and you lock other dice off, but where other people are involved as well. You're trying to, it's a roll and write. You're trying to cross off numbers on your grid, five different colours, trying to score the most points in each colour, and so on. Um, but what has elevated this for me is there's an online yes, version of it where you can play that and you just try and sit there going, oh, I've played, and I've played it loads. Um, and it doesn't, you'd think sometimes playing something online that much might actually put you off playing it in real life. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm happy to play it at work occasionally when it's quiet. I'll say, oh, do you fancy a quick game with this? Because we, we've printed our own set off and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I quite like it. It's quite skillful for what is just a simple well on that game. Has the retail version come out yet? Uh, not that, not that it's not come through the cafe yet. So it's taken so long. It's a fantastic game, though. I do really like this one, and it's one of those that wouldn't originally appeal to me at all. You know, you say it's the Yahtzee, it's like oh, okay, another Yahtzee style game, and it's roll and write. So literally, you throw the dice and you rank some numbers down. But it's just so engaging, and it's really hard to explain what it is about. It. There's no theme whatsoever, but it's. I think all the little bonus things. Yeah. It's like you roll the dice, you could write fill in the number here or here or here. But if I fill in this, I'll get a bonus which means I can then unlock this. And it's when you start chaining things together, yeah. it's so satisfying. Yeah, it was my pick for the Kinesh Bill. I'm glad it well, did well because it's, yeah, it's, it is like combo building. It makes, it takes that level above a normal roll and write. Mm. It's, there is, and it is quite complex of getting it all to work out and get that final big chain. Again, it's one of those games you start off slowly and think, I'm never going to fill this in. <laughs> yeah. And the end just like tick, 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 uh, tick, tick. It has like the bit I like in the Euro games where you can do this action to get this resource to allow you to do something else. Yeah. And you can do that in, uh, in what is a 15 minute game. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It's very good. Number 28. Uh, so, uh, my number 28 is an abstract strategy game. It is a game um, that I like because I'm good at it, and I think it's the best one in the series, and that is one from the Gip series called Yinch. Um, Yinch is effectively a better version of Othello. You're flipping discs over, but you're using separate pieces to do that. So you're placing a piece and then moving one of your kind of 
controller piece is to go around flipping other things. And you're trying to get five in a row three times. Um, I think for the Gip series, the games are great, but it's one of the games that gets harder the longer the game goes on because there's more pieces. A lot of the other games, kind of the board restricts itself and you have fewer moves to make. But in an abstract game, to make it in depth, you want kind of more options as you're going through the game. And I think Inch gives that to me. I think I prefer a couple of the other ones, particularly Devon, that's my favourite. But I think, I've never really thought about it, but that idea, as you say, that you're restricting the moves as you go on, I really like. <laughs> I don't like the fact that it's getting, oh, it's even more complicated now. And I'm not a huge abstract fan in general. The Gip series is solid. They're good games. And I can see why you've picked it. I wouldn't be a huge fan myself. Yeah, I think I've only played it once. I wouldn't want to pass judgment, but it's probably not my area. Yeah. <laughs> Two-player abstract yeah. games just don't get played often enough. I play with Dean on Sunday morning sometimes. So. Okay. Yeah, we do a few things like that. But yeah, it's a game I quite like, and it's the best in the series, in my opinion. Number 27. Uh, so my number 27 is my first Stefan Feld game on the list. There will be more. Um, and it is probably his... Uh, best regarded game I think it's the one that, that most people would say is his best game and that's the Castles of Burgundy um, it is his original kind of not his original point salad because he's had a few before that but it is his most well known point salad you're loosely in the fields of France and something trying to get tiles to go there's no theme there's there's it's, there's really dice, no it's, dice, it's a dice game but like in a lot of his games you've only got three you've only got two dice and on your turn yeah. you're restricted, but you've got all these different, if you build that building, you get another action, you get some workers to manipulate this dice, you get some goods to get one some silver, and you can do that. Um, and this game just does it so well. Um, it's held the test of time, it's still in the top 20 in board game geek, I believe. Um, and it is one of his best games. It's not my favourite foul, but it is a great classic in my opinion. It is very good. It's a bit too dry for me. I mean, <laughs> Stefan Belt games in general are a bit too dry for me, but it is really good. And it does the whole, like, the pretty darn clever thing of comboing things as you say you can do this to get this to this at first it feels like you're never going to fill that grid with all the different dice mm -hmm. spots but you very quickly start to fill them up as the game goes on because of the way you can combo things together uh, it's, it, it is really good I think it's my preferred fell because I do enjoy the filling in of the grid I feel the yeah. completion of that I enjoy that as the part of the thing and again they say the comboing to it, it speeds up and it's got dice playing from it and that sort of thing which I quite like and it, it all it, yeah, for me it's the preferred one and it's really good value for money it always has yeah. been a lot of his early games, actually, the components yeah. are pretty tacky. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so if you're looking to buy into some of his old games, they're not actually that expensive. They're still in like the £20 to £30 which region. Which is good for that game. For game. Yeah. You get out of that. A lot well, of value for money there, certainly. Number 26. So my, my number 26 is from a designer I might have mentioned before, Mr. Stefan Feld. <laughs> uh, and it is probably a game with... It's definitely not themeless, although the theme might be tacked on. It is it came with a very weird theme. You're in an underground, undersea submarine station, oh, wow. and that is Aquasphere. And Aquasphere mm -hmm. is a programming game. You effectively you move your programmers around to program robots, and the robots then go and do stuff. But you can program a robot, which all he does is program another robot, and it's it's a bit weird. But you're trying lots of different ways to get points, whilst trying not to lose points as well. It is a brain burner of a fell game. It's much, I think it's tougher to, to get into than the first game of uh, Castles of Burgundy. Yeah, that me. first play is definitely a learning mm. game. You're not going to do well. <laughs> yeah, learning to cross those lines is the... Oh, you yes. have requiring to get out that, that point hold and making sure you're there is... There's a scoring mechanism yeah. which, like, you might get 20 points, let's say, but at a certain point along the score track, there's just a red line, and in order to go past it, you have to hand in a black gem. Or, or, or deprogram a robot, but generally you don't want to... You, you kind of want to use all your robots that you can. So you might have five points, but if you're about to hit the red line and you don't have the appropriate thing to hand in, you just get stuck against this red line. Mm. I've never seen that before, but it, it's really clever. You've got to really think ahead about when am I going to get the points across the line yeah. and make sure you've got the right stuff to do it. Yeah, and then there's the octopods as well, octopodes, so, yeah. which do Jonathan and every time he plays. <laughs> if you control regions, you get a bit of a majority for area control, but if those regions have octopods in, you lose points per region per octopod, that sort of thing. Um, so you've kind of got to balance everything well, but you've got to do certain things quite a lot just to kind of get those big end game points. The first time I played it, I wasn't that keen on it, but I've played it quite a few times now, and every time I play it, I like it more than the previous play. It is a brain burner, but once you get the hang of it, I think it's fine, and there is lots of depth to it. The theme really is strange, though. It's, <laughs> it's 
I just don't know how we came <laughs> up with that. <laughs> but somehow all the mechanisms work together really well. It's it's a very well executed mm. game, I think. Yeah, I agree. Of, of, of all the fells I, I can think of off the top of my head right now, it's the one that I found the most difficult initially to understand what I was doing in the game. While a lot of his are relatively yes. not too bad to pick up, yeah. but that's got quite a lot of thinking straight off the bat. Uh, I think what happens when you first play and you're playing with someone who's played before is the person who's played before has just so many more actions and so many more and they, yeah. they manage their resources way better and you think well I can't do anything else now I've not got any time left I've not got any things and and you kind of see them shooting away in the score part, you know, the score, but or you kind of keep up with them and then you don't have that black jam and they, they jump through the hoops quicker than you uh, I think it's great if you haven't played it try it Number 25 so my number 25 is a game I have tremendous fun playing, even if I do poorly, and that is Galaxy Trucker. Uh, <laughs> it is a game where you're building this like makeshift spaceship to try and race to the end whilst picking up stuff and not getting shot down by pirates. Um, and the best games of this are the games where everyone's doing poorly, or several people are doing poorly, even if that's you. Because you you just sometimes you think, yeah, I've got a brilliant ship and everything goes wrong. Sometimes you think, please let me get to the end, please let me get to the end. Um, and to be honest, it's a game that I don't think the scoring matters too much. It's just fun to play. Yeah, I agree. There's a nice kind of slight catch-up mechanism in there in that if you have a smaller ship, when the pirate's shooting at the ship and the asteroids are flying past, if yours is smaller, it's harder to hit. Smaller targets. <laughs> <laughs> the big ships that manage to hold together end up getting hit far more than the little ships. So that's quite nice. But it is, yeah, it's just fun. It's not the kind of thing you can really strategize and plan to do the best at. You get better with practice because of the real time yeah, drawing yeah. the tiles when building it. Um, but still, you just, as you say, you've got to have a laugh, don't you, when it falls apart. If you stress over the fact that your ship is probably going to fall apart, it's just not going to be the game for yeah, you. Yeah. If you have that anxiety. But if you're quite happy to watch everybody else fall apart at the same time as yours, it's, it's, for a Euro game, it's a laugh. It is more fun when someone else's excellent shit falls yeah. apart. Yeah, you know, right, but if it happens to you, you can't, you know, you just gotta... Or when they've got an Exus ship, and then everybody looks and goes, that connection doesn't work, <laughs> and then half the ship falls yeah, off at yeah, the start. Yeah. Oh, I've, <laughs> had that, I've had that, yeah, it's funny. Number 24. Uh, so my number 24 is a game that I have spent more time preparing to play than playing it um, because I've been painting the miniatures oh. and that is Arcadia Quest. Um, we, I brought into the game uh, just so that I had a copy in our play group um, and I thought oh, it would be nice to get back into painting. I started painting the game and it's taken me months. I've still not finished it because I've bought too many bits for it. But uh, Arcadia Quest is, is a light-hearted dungeon crawl where you have to attack other people but not too much. Um, and you kind of get these characters that kind of power up massively as the game goes on. Uh, it's a game Mark's very good at, I'm not so good, but I do enjoy playing it. Yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> That's a bit, but it's a backstabbing, the backstabbing is probably one of the best bits of the game. He's about to win, shoot yeah, yeah, basically, it's exactly. It's like, jump through that portal, oh, I didn't see them coming then. Oh, no, it's, it's all falling apart. You've only really played it once, haven't you? Yes, it is a lot of fun, though, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. Um, the little TV miniatures are great. Um, Steve paints very well, I think, so that's always nice playing with his painted miniatures. Um, but yeah, it's just fun. It's not very serious. There's not a lot of strategy to it, but it is just great fun. There's a campaign feel to it as well, so I'm not really into cam 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 campaign games anyway, but you do more missions and you have slightly stronger characters. That kind of feels good, kind of progressing through there. Even if you don't ever succeed to a mission, you know, you're never the one that actually gets the main objective. Just going around and shooting other people's fun. Number 23. Uh, so my number 23, uh, previously I've done uh, uh, like a, an abstract game where Jonathan wasn't too fan with Yinch, and now I'm going to do one that Mark definitely doesn't like, and that's Ricochet Robots. <laughs> uh, Ricochet Robots is like a real-time um, problem-solving game where you just stare at a board, and when you find the solution, you go, six, and then everyone has until the time runs out to try and beat your solution. You're trying to get robots a little bit. Um, and it is a very divisive game. It's probably the most divisive game I know. Some people say, yeah, that game's not for me, but you know, I don't mind it. There's some people say, yeah, I love it, or I hate it, and, and we, we love it, and Mark does not. Um, but yeah, it's a great little game. There's some people who are play that are way better than me as well. Oh, There's yeah. a couple of people at Cafe, two or three people who just kind of hammer me when I play them, but I, I'll still give it a go because I just, you know, I do like finding these weird little roots around the board. It's great fun, I think, <laughs> but it, it has to, it's that puzzle solving thing. You're effectively just sitting there, each of you separately solving a puzzle, and some people are going to enjoy it and some people aren't. But I really like it, and the puzzle is just really interesting. It's a nice spatial puzzle, mm. so the robots kind of bounce off different corners, and you're trying to find a, the best bouncing route, if you like, with the shortest, fewest number of moves 
to get to the appropriate target. But I just really it's like a, solving it's the It's the fact you can move other robots as well. Yes. And you can bounce, you can move this robot here so that when this one comes down, it's going a different way. Yeah, it's very clever. I think ultimately I, I quite enjoy the puzzle. I dislike playing it with other people. Yeah. So Mark, Mark says if you just had a book of puzzles for extra yeah. robots, you would much That's fun. It. Yeah. Now, I think that would be the case with some of the other people <laughs> yeah. who actually don't mind the puzzles but they hate the competition side of it. Maybe it's because it, the it's a game that struggles if you the disparity in quality of the players. Yeah. If you're not very yeah. good, you're just not in the game. Yeah, and but therefore... it, and that is a problem with the game, I think. But not for me, I love it. Number 22. Um, so my number 22, as I've been gaming more and more, more um, light social deduction party games have crept into games I want to play. I always like them, but I think in this list they, they will appear more as the years go on, I think, because I think they hold up better than some of the Euro games. Um, and this one is a game I think is one of the best of its type. It's Deception uh, Murder in Hong Kong. Um, and the reason this is on my list and some of the other ones that aren't, so Avalon and Resistance aren't on the list because I think this is better than them, is because you have reasons to doubt people. It is not just a game about who can shout the loudest, about who's lying. You've got reasons. There's a code breaker who's trying to pass code, you know, trying to pass, trying to indicate which of the people on the table is a guilty suspect. And if I think that Mark is the guilty suspect because this and this, I can say it and he can't get angry at me. He's not going to say, no, no, you're lying because this. Well, no, I've got a reason for saying what I'm saying. And if he, if he wants to get me back, he's just going to find a reason for why I might be the murderer as well. Um, so it's a, one of the least aggressive social deduction games, but it's really nice. Some games can last five minutes because you get it straight away, but you can still win as the bad guys because you can still work out who who is in the know from the get-go. It's very good, I think, as social deduction games go. It's not a genre I'm a huge fan of generally, but it's certainly it's one of the ones I'd rather play. Yeah, and I love it I, for everything that Steve says. Uh, it just works really well for me. I think I like that mix of the puzzle of working out as well as the roles. Well, it's not just a roles like you uh, like one of the one night shows. You've got to use more to the game than just I'm I'm this character. It's I'm this character, and I'm trying to do this. Yeah, and you know why you have to lie. Yeah. You, there's a there's a reason for lying. Well, yeah. I'm the murderer. I've just got to try and deflect blame. I'm not trying to outlie someone. I'm just kind of trying to play the game so I don't get picked out. It's the only thing I find, I suppose, is that when you first play it, there's like a sea of information out in front of you because there's a pile of cards in front of every player and, it, and all these different um, like murder weapons, potentially, and... Um, Means, I think. Yeah. Means and, yeah. And it's just like, oh my goodness, where do I start? You know, there's a syringe and a hammer and a knife and... Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, because you've got to connect those, don't you? Yeah, but the, the, it's the forensic scientist is the one connecting them. Yeah. Um, so you've just got to kind of if you're if you're not the murderer, it's not too bad on your first play, I think. Yes. Um, because you can just say, well, okay, yeah. listen to other people. Okay, I like what he's saying. Yeah, that makes sense. I can. Yeah, that's right. You just got to go with him, persuaded or otherwise. Number twenty one. Uh, so my number 21, the last of this uh, part of my top 30, is a game that I think um, has held up well over the years. It's a game called Concordia, um, and Concordia is a light Euro game. Now, generally, I like my Euro games to be heavy, but I just like the simplicity of Concordia. On your turn, you pick a card at the end, you play it, and you do what that card says. Um, it generally isn't too much you know, time on someone's turn. Even if you're playing five players, the game can go fairly quickly. Um, and it's very easy to see what you need to do. People can't get in your way too much. Maybe they can take the spot you want, but that's the same when you're, you know, like work, play, work, play some games. It has a very light trading in the Mediterranean theme that can sometimes get put around it. But this one does it better than most. I think there is a reason for doing what you're doing. You're kind of expanding to different areas, producing different goods. Um, you're trying to kind of balance, kind of expanding out with getting these cards to get you the points at the end of the game. Um, and generally, most of the people I play with, it, even if it's their first game of it, do quite well and do quite like the game. Yeah, it is very good. It the theme doesn't grab me at all. You know, it, trading in the Mediterranean has been done to death, but this just doesn't make any attempt to give it any life at all. <laughs> it's super bland, but actually, it's simple to play. You know, what you're doing is very straightforward. But it still gives you quite a lot to think about. And I really like that. The whole, there's that tension, isn't there, between you know, wanting to build up cards because you're getting like set collections for the cards, but you also need presence on the map. You need to get to as many different locations as possible. So, so the cards score. And so you're getting stuff back. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. So it works really well. I like the optimization of the scoring. So obviously you go, you may just want, you're going to want a range of scoring, but you often kind of settle on them. I'm going to try and do these couple really well I need a lot of those cards as they come out but also I really like that um, 
I want to go to areas where I think other people are going to score the goods for because that helps me. So it's yeah. going. So there's a bit more. There is a little bit interactive going. Well, I think they're going to keep using that area, and if they keep using that area, I get my good because I've got a house like a building there, and that's yeah. important. Yeah, you can build alone in one mm. place, and you you keep reactivating yeah. yourself to get lots of stuff yourself. But if other people see that, they leech off you. But if you spread around, brilliant. You're getting lots of little bits of people, but you haven't got that place yourself where you can say, "Oh." Okay, it's my turn. What do I leech now? I've only got one in each place. I can't really get too much when it's my turn to do the same thing. Um, so Concordia, I think, it's held up well. It's like five years old now, I think. Um, it's got loads of maps as well, and it's got an expansion. Expansion's not needed, but the base game is sound. Anyway, so that's my first 10 in my countdown to my top 30 games of all time. Uh, that is 30 through 21. Uh, anything you want to talk about there, guys? Any surprises? Any new uh, games? Something that was really unexpected in that uh, set. The obligatory Stefan Fells <laughs> popped his head up a couple of times. Twice. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of anything I thought you'd have lower. I think they're, that's they're about the, re the level that I thought those games would be at. I'm, I maybe thought Concordia could be a few places down, but other than that... I wasn't expecting Sagrada to be in there, but thinking about it, actually, you do request it a lot, don't you? you know, well, it's good. It it's a nice filler, I think. Like, like a 30-minute filler that you can do at the end of the night. Yeah, that's very good. Um, so yeah. Uh, so anyway, next uh, time you're watching, you'll be looking at my 20 through 11. There are a few surprises uh, still to come, a few new games popping on the list this year, so uh, hopefully I will uh, shock these two a bit with uh, my choices. <laughs> um, but uh, if you've got any comments about the games I've picked, please uh, write them in the comments below. And if you'd like to subscribe to our channel, we'd very appreciate it. It costs you nothing, but it helps us out tremendously, so thank you very much. Um, I've been Steve. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Mark. And we'll hope you join you next time at the table. Bye!